Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm one of the tech artists uh, that works on the game dev team at, at SideFX. Um, I, I need to apologize. I have a bit of a head cold, so if I'm talking through my nose, uh, that's why. Uh, and if you can't understand me, uh, I will re-record this and put it up online so you can actually figure out what's going on. Um, just a, a quick question. Um, how many people here are using the game dev tools? Wow, quite a few. So how many people here are brand new to this, this, this stuff called game dev tools? OK. OK, so about 50, 50, 40, 60. Um, oh, do we have any seats available? Is there another one? It's over here. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so um, essentially what I'm going to be doing uh, in the next 20, 25 minutes is really just giving an overview of what we've been doing since about October last year because we, uh, we move fast, uh, we don't break stuff, um, or not too much. Um, and, uh, and so this is kind of a whirlwind tour of just some of the things that we've done. Um, and we've had other talks over the course of the week, and there'll be more tomorrow that kind of go more in depth. So if you are looking for kind of a deep dive, this isn't necessarily uh, where you're gonna find that, but this will give you an overview of just some of the stuff that we have done and what we're thinking about doing for the rest of the year. Um, so um, very quickly, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about you know, who we are, what we do, um, and kind of how they're developed. Um, we, we, we have a a kind of a development model, which it's probably not unfamiliar, but it, it helped you understand how you can be involved in this process as well. Uh, so right now we have about over 100 tools in the game dev tool set. Uh, they're available on GitHub. You can download them from there or directly in Houdini. There's a little button you can click on to update and install. Um, and the whole point of these tools really is for the games community to, to soften the learning curve getting into Houdini. Uh, we saw a really interesting stat recently that most people using Houdini in games have about one to three years of experience. So they're kind of more junior and mid-level, which means you kind of need a little bit more uh, assistance getting into the stuff before you get to the advanced stuff. Um, and like I said earlier, it's myself, uh, Louise Krull and Paul, um, I never get his surname right, so I'm not going to say it. Um, and the three of us essentially are developing the tools uh, that you have available to you. So we have Houdini, which has a whole bunch of great nodes and a whole lot of good work. And you can think of that as kind of your base framework. And when you're working in a studio, uh, you're generally building tools on top of that. And this can be for any DCC package. Uh, you're, you're creating things that are specific to your project, or you're creating them uh, to interop with, with uh, your game engine or whatever else there might be. And essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to generalize those tools. So if we hear something from multiple customers that we think could benefit the community, we take on that work ourselves, we develop it, and then we give it back to you. So you can almost think of the three of us as like three extra tech artists on your team um, to be developing these kind of tools. And um, we, we kind of cover a broad range of stuff from common workflows um, things that we see being done over and over and over again, and if it can be repeatable, it should be a tool and you shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, import export is a big one still. How do you get it out of Houdini into your game engine or out of Houdini into something else? Um, there's a lot of time wasted in that space, um, and the shorter we can make that, um, the more iterations you can do. Uh, simplified UX, so sometimes there are like 10 nodes to do something which is a, a standard, standard workflow. We wrap that up. We expose the most important controls for the work you're going to do 80% of the time. Um, and then lastly is we also focus on third-party integrations. So uh, for instance, we have um, the, the, the ZBrush uh, GoZ bridge. So you can bring stuff directly from ZBrush into Houdini, make some changes and see that as a brush in ZBrush uh, immediately. Um, Reality Capture, I'll be talking more about that a little bit later and then things like OpenStreetMap. So any information, data, DCC that we think can be uh, beneficial to add to the environment, we're gonna focus on that too. So right now, uh, we have about 3,600 users using these tools, uh, which is awesome for us because this slide six months ago said about 300. So there's clearly uh, value in adding these tools uh, and, and hearing from you in terms of what we can build next. And that's kind of the thing. We want to hear what your problems are. Uh, that's important to us because that's how we figure out what to do. Uh, and so to speak a little bit about that, um, this is kind of our development cycle. We will come and speak to you or you will come and find us. 
um, and we'll kind of get a sense of what your workflow is, what your pipeline is, or the problems you're having, and then we'll go away and we'll make a minimal viable product. We'll give that back to you, get some feedback as to like how that's working, do a couple of iterations, and then we re release that to the community. So yeah, this is kind of our, our development cycle. Um, we, 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 we hold ourselves to, to a pretty high standard. We really try and stick to this as much as possible. Um, and it's up to you to keep us accountable. So we appreciate if you would do that. So let's get into the good stuff. What kind of stuff have we been making? Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is the mesh pipeline. Uh, this is something we spoke about last year as well. Um, it's, it's a pretty common workflow within games where you need to take your high-res mesh, bring it down to something that's game ready. You might need to lay out your UVs, you need to bake out your maps, and then get that into your game engine. Uh, and we've done a number of things to improve upon that workflow since we spoke about it last year. So last year we released um, a reality capture plugin within Houdini that basically wrapped around the reality capture API for photogrammetry. So you were able to uh, bring in um, your images uh, into uh, Houdini. It will then generate the point cloud. And then a mixture of Houdini tools and the reality capture tools will give you a high res mesh with normals, color, that kind of stuff. And then we use the Houdini tools to kind of bake it down, decimate it, deal with that side of the, the, the process. Uh, so we now also have um, an Alice Vision integration. And if you don't know Alice Vision, it's an open source um, effort um, that is also photogrammetry based. Um, but because it's open source, it means it's free, because Reality Capture does unfortunately come with a cost. Um, and it is slower than some of the commercial options out there. But ideally, what we want to try and do is leverage PDG. If you haven't heard about that yet, uh, it's our ability to kind of distribute work and then bring those dependencies back together. So that if you do have a, a build farm or a number of machines, uh, it should speed up that process. But it means that if you are looking to get into photogrammetry, uh, you now have that capability. And we have different nodes for each of the, pro the, the, the phases of photogrammetry, uh, which you have access to. Um, and then Paul's actually wrap that all up into one node so that if you just need to very quickly uh, kind of uh, generate the mesh, uh, then you can do that as well. Um, the results are, are, are pretty good. I would say that um, they're better suited for environments and props. They're not quite there for characters and there you might want to use reality capture. Um, but it's just another offering that we're, we're kind of supporting at this point. Uh, and we'd love to get feedback on it. Uh, we've already heard users saying they want a Linux uh, version and a Mac version. Right now we have uh, the Windows version, I believe, uh, ready to go. So the other thing is log generation. Uh, and I think this is something which, which all um, games kind of need to deal with. Uh, and we now have a, uh, a tool which will allow you to generate those logs. And a couple of things to this. The one is obviously the, the decimation. So we have a really powerful node called PolyReduce, uh, which will keep your silhouettes, keep the detail where you need it to be. Uh, and so we've wrapped around that um, to give you these different LODs. Uh, but then as well as that, uh, we're doing um, material um, uh, consolidation. So if you have multiple materials, with multiple UV sets for an object, uh, and you get down to the low LOD, uh, we use some of our other nodes to now wrap that into a single UV space um, and then rebake those textures. Uh, so super efficient, um, and there's still more work that we'd like to do on generating LODs because we know that there are uh, options out there that have some really cool features, um, and we're going to be starting to add those over time as well. Uh, and the great thing with some of these tools is you can actually take it into some of your other packages if you're using Houdini Engine. So this is the, the same LOD tool uh, being used in Maya through Houdini Engine. Um, and one of the things that we also do is your very last LOD can be an imposter. So it will just be a single sprite, will generate a 360 uh, render of that object, and then in the shader it will pick whichever view it needs um, and match it to that object. Um, so it doesn't just have to happen in Houdini, you can also use it in your DCC packages, uh, Max, Maya, um, and uh, I don't think we've quite figured out how to do it in, in Unity and in Unreal, but it, yeah, without the materials, but it is possible to kind of have that in wherever you're trying to do your work. Um, 
So this is super cool. I'm really excited about this. We have the ability to bake maps. That's uh, been around for a while. Um, but we now have a Heightfield uh, COPS based map baker. Um, and if you've ever baked maps, uh, either in Houdini or other packages, it does take a, a little bit of time. Um, this is running essentially in real time, but now you can bake out your diffuse, your normals, your AO, and any custom maps you want uh, in very little time. It's robust, it works really well, um, and that is now available as part of the game dev tool set. Um, this kind of will replace our simple baker, uh, which sounds simple, but under the hood was not simple and was a bit of a, a mission to, to look after. Um, the other cool thing with this is that you can basically customize your, your map. So let's say you want to combine your diffuse with your AO before you output that, um, the, the COP network is exposed. So you can go in and do your own math calculations, image com combinations, uh, so you can customize what that bake looks like for your game. Um, as part of all of that, you know, you really want to be able to see what you're doing in the viewport because I think that's kind of become table stakes. If you're working in a game engine, you expect to see the final result up front. And so we did a bunch of work on the viewport shader to match what you would get from a final render. So what you're seeing here on the left is what this uh, PBR um, shader looks like in the viewports and on the right in that box is essentially Mantra our renderer um, and they're almost indistinguishable. Besides soft shadows and a little bit of occlusion stuff, they're, they're pretty much the same. So what it means now is that what you see is what you get whether you're in Substance or Unreal or Houdini, uh, you know that that material pipeline uh, is exactly the same and you're not having to now deal with is it a gamma correction issue or something else that might be affecting your shader. Uh, so this is actually in 17.5 directly. Uh, there is a game dev uh, shader as well. And the reason for that discrepancy um, is something else that we've added is the ability to deal with MCT tangents. So um, in 17.5, uh, we added a feature of the polyframe node that will actually output uh, MCT tangents. But right now, the shader in 17.5 uh, doesn't consume those. So we have included that in the viewport shader, and at some point they will integrate. Um, so the difference is, is this is without, and if you have a look at the, the corner of the mouth, you can really see it. Um, so that's with MCT tangents, um, and of course that is without. So it's pretty subtle, um, but it does make a big difference um, uh, in the process. So that's kind of our, our, our mesh pipeline stuff. I might have something else a little bit later that I'll, I'll discuss as well, but we know that this is a very common area within games that uh, can really benefit from procedural systems, and we're constantly looking for ways of making that whole process a lot easier and more automated. Uh, so uh, how many people here have uh, seen the Far Cry or Wildlands talks that were given over the last two years on how Houdini was used? One or two, three hands, okay. So we often get this, we have customers who do this amazing work with our tools, and then we have other customers and say, I want that too. And we're like, okay, well, give, give us four years and we'll get back to you. Um, uh, and one of the biggest requests has been uh, city and building generation and, and general terrain stuff. Uh, so we now have a building generator as part of the game dev tool set. Um, and what that means is, uh, it's basically a, a rule-based module system so that you can define your, your, uh, your wall or the side of a building and then taking all of your kit bash modules, your assets, you can feed it into the system and it will populate that space. So uh, it, it makes a lot quicker to procedurally generate these buildings. Uh, as well as that, we also have volume override. So if you want to have a very specific um, uh, asset uh, as part of that building, which doesn't match that rule set, uh, you can use a volume to override that area, uh, choose what thing you want to place there, and instead of it just doing a Boolean cutout and placing that in there, it'll actually recalculate that entire floor uh, to shift everything around. So even if it doesn't match the metrics of whatever your, your uh, kit bash assets are, it'll still manage to fit all of those into the space uh, and kind of rebuild that, that building asset. Um, and, and this can also be extended to other things. So if you do want a volume to override, say you want to do stairwells or stairways, you can have that running over multiple floors. You can say 
based on an attribute, pull this module, uh, and it will then populate and add that to your building. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff here you can do um, pretty quickly um, using existing assets. And I think this is something we really wanted to push on. Instead of building the, the, the buildings procedurally uh, from scratch, we want to take your existing game assets and use that as a starting point for, for making these more complex um, objects. And this is just some of the things that were created with the building generator. We had an intern in LA uh, spend a couple of weeks figuring out the system, sourcing uh, the various pieces, and she was able to make these three rather different distinct buildings using that tool. So once you're up and running, you can probably spit out a building in a day or two with what you've got. Uh, and the great thing about that as well is if you are using our Mapbox and OSM um, tools, you can also use that to then feed into the building generator. So you can bring in your OSM data and then have that drive the building generator in order to populate your cities. So now we're talking about building cities at scale uh, with the tools that are available to you. Um, and um, this is, I, I have to laugh every time I show this, but uh, we now have a spiral swap. And the reason I'm laughing about this <laughs> It's because I think almost every single person in side effects at some point or another has made a spiral swap but never released it to the public. And I'm sure you at some point have also gone, you know what would be great is a spiral swap. <laughs> so finally we now have that in uh, the game dev tools. Um, and it's really getting back to basics of uh, deformers and simple geometries that you can then use for more complex things. Um, so this is just some of the features that the spiral swap has. You can have multiple spirals to create a helix. Uh, you can control the taper, uh, the bend. Um, and I think this is something we want to continue doing is, is what other deformers would help you kind of create complex shapes in a procedural way. So um, I mentioned one of the other things uh, that I wanted to talk about in terms of mesh pipeline stuff is UV transfer. Um, this is often something that uh, we've run into problems with. Uh, there is an attribute transfer node in Houdini, but it doesn't do a great job of transferring UV. So if you have two meshes which um, are identical in shape but different in UV layout, uh, you often get kind of that mess in the middle where your UVs look great and they're not so great. And so we've kind of figured out the logic behind that and, and played around with it. And now you are able to transfer UVs from one object to another. So I think that's really going to help with the mesh pipeline as well. Uh, carrying on and kind of table stake stuff, uh, matcap shaders. Um, how many here have used matcap shaders? Just in general. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in Houdini, we've just released it. Why haven't you used it yet? <laughs> um, so matcap shaders are um, a really cool way of uh, defining a shader based on an image. Um, you can generate these yourself, um, or you can use the library that we have. And so it allows you to, to view something in the viewport um, without necessarily doing a bunch of complex calculations. Um, it's really just good for this kind of stuff, whether you're doing a fluid simulation and you want to get a rough sense of what that might look like, uh, or if you're doing kind of modeling and you want kind of a clay feel to it, um, or a little bit of goo. Uh, but it just gives you a very quick viewport representation of what your object is going to look like, hopefully, uh, in-game. Uh, so that's just some of the stuff that we've developed um, over the last six months. Um, but there's a ton more. Uh, I think uh, Paul actually just spoke about some of the stuff we did for the Unity demo. Uh, leading up to GDC, we, we created a Unity demo. And out of that, a bunch of tools came. Uh, these are some of them. Um, some of the highlights, I would say, things like dirt skirts and snow buildup or buildup on objects. Uh, we also helped out with um, the Quixel um, video that Epic showed uh, yesterday at the State of um, um, Unreal. Um, and so all of those tools that we built for those two projects are now available as part of the game dev tool set. Um, and so this is just some of that stuff that, that you can find. Uh, we'll be releasing videos and tutorials if they, they require them to better understand how to use them. Um, but I just want to kind of very quickly give you a rundown of what some of those might be. So what's happening going forward? Um, I think this is uh, pretty exciting for us. This is what we want to focus on for the rest of the year. Um, 
right off the bat, I'm going to say that we really want to push on characters and environments. Um, we think there's room for improvement and, and an opportunity to work on just, just general character workflow, whether it's uh, rigging, dealing with mocap, character effects like cloth and hair and that kind of thing, um, as well as environments. We've already shown the, the building generator. We're going to keep working on street generation, dealing with intersections, um, any tools that will help with that process. Um, and something I didn't mention earlier is also things like socket attachments for those buildings. So if you want to attach a lamppost or a neon sign to the building, we want to create a way to, to make that easy for you to do. Um, and then as well as that is UX. Um, we believe one of the best ways we can support you as, as, as developers and, and artists is making that process as easy as possible. So that can be any, anything from scene management to staying in the viewport as opposed to the network editor, working with Pi panels. Um, we're trying to just remove some of that kind of pain points that you might hit along the way. Uh, and then finally, VFX is still a big part of Houdini and it's still a big part of what we want to do from the game dev tools. So you can expect to see more from the Niagara plugin that we released last year. Um, we're looking to, to work with Epic to kind of do the next iteration on that. Um, and then something that we're also focusing on is stylized effects. Uh, there isn't a lot of stuff out there at the moment in the community on how to make stylized effects. So I'll actually be talking more about that tomorrow where I'll go into how not to make an explosion, uh, which is the many ways that didn't work before we found a way that did work and some of the tools that we've developed around that. Um, and then this is kind of a VFX environments thing is uh, a skybox maker. Um, a lot of studios have said they want something that can quickly generate a skybox uh, with clouds and with sun and atmosphere and those kind of bits and pieces. So we're going to try and release something like that this year um, to support that effort. Um, and that is the end of my talk for the day. So thank you.